Welcome everyone to our CFD conversation, the path to accessibility for New York Fashion Week, which we bring to you in recognition of Disability Pride Month. My name is Sasha Brown, and I'm the Director of Professional Development at the CFDA. We're incredibly proud to be partnering with Gamut Management on this conversation, a trailblazing consulting and talent management company that represents people with disabilities across the fashion, lifestyle, and entertainment industries. As we quickly approach New York Fashion Week in September, brands, PR agencies, production and event companies will start making decisions about location, event design, and front of back of house organization. As you make event decisions, is accessibility for your guests and talent considered? And if you don't show during Fashion Week, but you host special events or presentations throughout the year, is accessibility top of mind? There is so much to be considered around accessibility, and our experts today who are joining us will be able to share with you how to start taking steps that will allow you to open up your brands to people with disabilities. Mindy Shire is Gamut's CEO and a longtime friend and supporter of the CFDA, and we're so grateful to her for bringing this group together and leading this conversation for us. Also joining us is Paola Carozo, a disability activist, content creator and model, Jody Thompson, president of Revolution Marketing, and Richard Loya, who is an ASL interpreter. Now it's my pleasure to hand it over to Mindy. Thank you so much, Sasha. We are so grateful and excited to open up this conversation to the CFDA. And because of the topic that we are speaking about today, we want to be as inclusive as we possibly can. And that always starts with a visual description. As we don't know who will be watching or listening to this webinar, so we do something called a visual description, which is, hi, I'm Mindy Shire. I am a 51-year-old white woman with freckles and curly red hair. I'm wearing a light pink, in my opinion, fabulous blazer with significant shoulder pads. Um, and behind me, I have a wall of logos that say Gamut Management and Runway of Dreams. To my left in my left box is our interpreter, Richard, who is a Hispanic male with glasses, dark hair, wearing a black t-shirt. And again, we are so excited to be here. A little bit about my story, and then we'll turn it immediately over to the panelists. I am a fashion designer by trade. I'm also the mom of a now 18-year-old son with muscular dystrophy. And we learned very early on that he was going to struggle with everyday tasks, one of which is the very thing I love more than anything, and that's getting dressed every day. For Oliver, it was a daily reminder of what he could not do, which are buttons and zippers, putting pants over his leg braces, putting on shoes, etc. So I decided in 2013 to have a small goal of changing the fashion industry to be inclusive of people with disabilities, and I started the Runway of Dreams Foundation. In 2016, we partnered with Tommy Hilfiger, made fashion history by developing the first ever mainstream adaptive clothing line, which is now Tommy Adaptive. What that partnership did was really open the floodgates to so many other brands in the fashion and beauty industry to reach out to Runway Dreams, to want to be connected to people with disabilities, to really understand how they can develop products and services for people with disabilities. So it became very clear that a second company needed to be born, and that was Gamut Management. In 2019, we became the first consulting and talent management company exclusively representing people with disabilities and only working with brands on how to create products and services and events and marketing and PR, et cetera, all including people with disabilities and becoming disability confident which is what leads us to the conversation today, is how can we together make New York Fashion Week or any fashion uh, presentation or event as accessible as possible? And the best way to do that is to really introduce you to our panelists today, who will be sharing their experiences and their expertise in the accessibility space as it relates to runways, presentations, and events. 
First, I'd love to introduce Paola. Paola, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, everybody. My name is Paola Caroso. I am a 28-year-old Latin white woman. Currently, I have brownish ash blonde hair. I am white. I'm wearing a white tank top, and my background is just a white wall. Uh, three years ago, I decided to become a disability activist, content creator, and model after exiting a fashion PR career um, as a publicist where I saw that there was way too many stigma, stereotypes, and discrimination in the industry for real diversity. That led me to go on and create my own path of being my own publicist, my own brand as a content creator and as a model. And three years in, I've worked with brands like Tommy Hilfiger, thanks to Mindy, um, Google, Facebook, and many, many others. And as I just moved on to New York City, I lived in Miami all my life, and I just made my move to New York City to follow my dreams as in fashion and as a disability activist. I really can't wait to de dig deeper into this conversation on how we can make New York Fashion Week more accessible. Thank you so much. Jody. over to you. I'm Jody Thompson. I am a 43-year-old white woman with um, short, dark hair and a sort of cream colored boho style top, uh, mm -hmm. sitting in front of a few bookcases filled with books uh, and some music too. Um, I am president at Revolution Marketing. We have been in business for over 20 years and we have been partners with the Runway of Dreams Foundation and Gamut Management um, since 2016 and 2019 respectively. Uh, and we have been working to produce accessible events of all kinds, but specifically uh, runway shows, virtual events, uh, and other brand sponsored events. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So, Jody, I'm going to start with you. Um, because of our experience together and really working with uh, Revolution to understand what does it take to create a an accessible runway show. Can you give us um, a, a few key elements um, and what you really learned from this almost decade of working in the accessibility uh, production space? Yeah, I, what we've learned is that it really just, as with any other event production, takes a little bit of time and um, additional thought to make sure that we're providing uh, really accessible, truly accessible events. For instance, for with runway shows in particular, uh, New York Fashion Week, the old buildings in New York can sometimes be problematic. So starting with um, a venue that has made those modifications in terms of ramps, elevators, um, just overall space, bathrooms that can accommodate um, any anybody and are in accordance with the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act is a great place to start. Um, and then from there, when you consider uh, if your stage needs any modifications for any of your models, um, front of house space, making sure that your uh, aisles are large enough for not just wheelchairs, but people with different mobility devices, um, making sure that they're free from any trip hazards, that sort of thing. It seems very uh, intu intuitive, but there's a lot of moving parts that kind of go into it, but still very, very doable. Um, sort of same thing for back of house, making sure that you have that space to accommodate all sorts of different types of mobility, uh, as well as providing ample seating, um, any special dressing room needs that any of the models may need, um, space for companions, that sort of thing. Um, and then finally, thinking about something that we're doing this year um, for the first time is providing a sensory room for anybody um, who may not have mobility uh, issues, but uh, providing them a safe space to go to get away from, you know, the noise and lights and everything that goes into a, a stage production. Thank you for that um, 
overview. And I think there's a there's a couple things I'd love to kind of draw out a little bit. The first is maybe we can talk through uh, the experience that we had. One of our shows was uh, actually a few of our shows at Runway of Dreams were at Cipriani Spaces. So obviously landmark spaces, um, for example, there were stairs in, in some of the locations internally that would uh, have prohibited people with disabilities to get up to experience part of the show or the post party. Can you talk about a little bit of how did you manage that to make it accessible for anyone to get to any space? Absolutely. That was definitely an interesting few years that we were over at, at Cipriani's. Um, but such a beautiful venue, you really want to make sure that you're able to take advantage of spaces like that. Uh, there were instances where we needed to bring in uh, a lift. It's a very simple apparatus. It goes up um, several feet and anybody with mobility issues or in a wheelchair can you know, be raised up from that ground floor to that second level so that they can access everywhere in the venue. Um, <clears throat> additionally, we needed to actually use the space outside of Cipriani's as well. Um, on the street, we brought in some trailers, we ramped over the curbs and steps up into the building, and we were able to use the street for um, that ground level dressing room access for all of the models and their companions. So a lot of, like I said, a lot of different moving parts when you look at each specific venue, but um, nothing insurmountable. Exactly. Thank you. That's that's really what I wanted to underscore that we have been in extremely inaccessible venues like Cipriani, just because it's a, a grandfathered in. We love Cipriani, um, but we've also been in very accessible venues, the newer venues that have strict requirements. And the, the key part of this is that it can be done. It is absolutely something that with including people with disabilities that we did a walk through a roll through a crutch through so we could really see where any stumbling points could be or really rethink that and for that example specifically jody if if memory serves i remember that the the team at cipriani was so incredibly grateful that we were able to show and educate them on what they could do for events even outside of fashion week to bring in more people with disabilities to be able to enjoy the event. Is that accurate? Absolutely, absolutely. And I have actually been there at subsequent events and sort of noticed that they had taken some of the um, ideas that we had brought to them for our event and made sure that it was, um, you know, they were repurposing those ideas for other future events. Um, the work that we do outside of the work that we do with Runway of Dreams Foundation, um, we're always talking to different event producers and, and coming in and saying, hey, this festival tent that you're providing us is not accessible to everybody. We need you to, you know, put make sure that we've got ramps and um, these different requirements. And I will see that they do that site-wide, not just for our spaces. So event producers are absolutely um, grateful when you start to bring in that kind of information to them. Amazing. Actually, Sasha, I'm going to jump over to you out of turn a little bit, um, because you also, when we did an event together with Gamut and the CFDA in person, I think you experienced something um, of that nature. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting to hear the story about Cipriani, because I think it, it also um, is super relatable to what we experienced. However, we were working with like a within a very modern, new, huge building, um, incredibly accessible, but not every room that we were working within was accessible. And I think this is such a timely conversation because so most buildings have to be ADA compliance, but not all the team members who are working with you on events and production are as familiar with this compliance. So while working with this team, we ran into a little bit of difficulty of uh, them not being able to provide us with the ramps. So unfortunately, we had to make sure that 
they were understanding, uh, you know, that they had to provide this and we had to seek some legal counsel. And in the end, they were able to provide the ramp. But for designers and small companies that are producing the events, they might not feel like they have the resources, the knowledge, the experience to have these conversations as they produce events. But please know there are companies and people like Mindy and the CFDA who are there to support you and Jody who can help you navigate those sometimes tricky or complicated conversations. Absolutely. And there's always a way. There really is always a way to make a venue or an event compliant. Um, and we really haven't had any examples really of something that we couldn't modify. Um, so I do wanna underscore that it is absolutely possible. Paula, I'm gonna switch over to you because I, we wanna see it from the perspective of being a part of an event mm -hmm. or a show as a woman and a model and a talent with a disability. Can you share with us maybe some examples of things that, uh, experiences that were not accessible Mm -hmm. and the profound experiences that were accessible and what that meant to you. Yeah, for sure. So I think one of the biggest mistakes that the industry is currently making is they're great at including us, but they think we are good, which is ADA compliance. So I walk into these great studios, automatic doors at the entrances, ramps everywhere, elevators. But once I get to the set, it's a hurdle to get through. There are cables all over the floor. I'm tripping half of the time. And for somebody who has my mobility, I have a physical disability. I was diagnosed with cerebral palsy um, due to an traumatic brain injury. My disability is mainly in my legs. Um, it's very minimal. I use a cane for support, but for anybody who doesn't have the mobility that I have, you are essentially hiring a model who has hurdles to do her job. And again, I feel like companies, brands, and clients think that, oh, you know, it's, it, it's an ADA compliant um, studio. They're up to date somehow. We're good. But then it's like we walk in and I'm like, okay, but like I can't, like I need support to get through these cables. And, you know, oftentimes my mobility aid is not enough to get me through. Um, I think dressing rooms need tremendous amount of work. Those foam walls do not work very well. I have very bad balance. So for me, anything with like these foam walls or these like um, tracks that just kind of move around, it becomes tricky because I tend to lean on things for support and I'm there trying to get dressed and like I'm leaning on and then it's just like falls to the floor and you know, I'm just there bare. Um, I also think that when it comes to events, I feel that events do a much better job at having a relationship with the talent that is coming in. I don't know why that is, but my experience with events, I have these um, influencer managers or talent managers reaching out like, what are your accommodations? You know, what do you need? We're providing you with an Uber code. Um, do you need assistance entering the 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 the, the restaurant, the place. These are images of the entrance. Do you need anything else? So I, I, I feel like there is a gap between modeling studios and actual influencer talent that kind of needs to be reached. Um, besides that, I've had some great experiences with um, the photographers, the talent managers themselves. However, I still think there is a lot of stigma in between non-disabled models and disabled models. When I walk into shoots, it's very like disabled models go this way, non-disabled models go this way. You guys are shooting two completely separate things. You guys will never unify. And I understand that there's a lot of marketing, PR, branding, strategy perspectives that go behind that because I used to be me sitting behind that desk but now being the model, it can be very easy to feel like I'm still not included, despite mm -hmm. the fact that I am being hired to be here. I would also would love to see more playfulness on shoots. Um, I think there should be scheduled calls with models and with these talent managers to really emphasize what kind of shoot this is. Um, what product are we gonna be showing? What product are we gonna be modeling? 
and exactly how playful can we get I've been on tons of shoots where I don't know why for some reason photographers stylists and set managers think we can't be touched Mm. it's kind of like I'll help you get there lean on whatever you need sit if you need to and then you know just pose however you can pose in five pictures and we're done and I remember in the last photo shoot that I was in I'm like, guys, this feels tense. This feels, this is not fun. You know, I want to make this fun. Disability is fun. Disability is something that we've worked so hard to incorporate into our identity as something positive. I cannot have any of these images published of me looking like a robot. My community is going to scream at me if, <laughs> if they see this because it's just not fun. So I think there are many good things in the industry. You know, I think that we're, we're definitely making a stride specifically with the, S, with the CFDA um, hosting this panel. Extremely grateful for that. But I do think we still need to connect deeper with the talent, with the models on set and really express disability, how it is positively. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pull out a couple of things um, from those remarks. First, maybe could you describe from your perspective what it was like to be on a runway when you were in the show in Miami for Runway of Dreams mm -hmm. that was completely accessible? accessible. How yeah. was that experience versus maybe other runways that were not? Well, I mean, there were no issues there. You know, we just kind of walked in, did our thing. Um, I just felt like people got it, you know, like you, and this is the thing that I still feel that disabled models aren't taken seriously in the industry. You know, we kind of walk in, it's like, Hey, you know, great to have you. This is what you're going to do. You go on that side. And, you know, being on the runway of dreams, is kind of just like everybody is like you, you know, you don't feel like they're taking you you know, you don't feel like you're more important or less important. You just feel like you came as you are. And I think that's important to exhibit to other agencies and, and talent companies. So to be just to have a little takeaway on that is to be truly inclusive and not just <laughs> perhaps checking a box. Great for us. Exactly. We have a model or a talent with a disability. Let's engage her or him or they into the the group of other talent the full experience correct the full yeah, experience every time i walk into these other shoots with huge labels huge brands it still feels like okay i'm hired for two hours and then i'm going home you know and if it's not me making the effort to like you know connect with other people or kind of like be feel like I am unified if it's not for me making that effort it's not there you know and I feel like the industry needs more of that because then we are just really checking on the box and this is not going to fix anything with disability absolutely and I think the other takeaway from uh, what you just described is how important it is to have pre-calls or really yes. understand in advance um the needs of the talent getting to know them a bit more um something really important that gamut management always does is we provide an accessibility rider mm -hmm. so everybody um on set is very clear on what you mm -hmm. Paula, need on set um if not, we always do if they want some webinars or discussions beforehand so they can get more comfortable with Mm -hmm. The fact that you do need to, for example, wear shoes um, mm -hmm. on set because it helps with your stability. Mm -hmm. um, and it, what we have heard in return from the production companies, and, and Jody, I'll, I'll loop you into this as well, is the gratitude of thank you so much. We were a little nervous. We didn't know mm -hmm. what how to handle that. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for explaining why we need a ramp there or why this elevator location isn't ideal. Things like that mm -hmm. make it so much better for behind the scenes and in front of the camera or behind the, the runway and in front of the runway. Jody, would you agree with that? Absolutely. You know, that's where a lot of our learning has come from as well when we are 
speaking with the different talent and talent management um, to make sure that we're providing everything and allowing us to think through what that means. So in your example, if the elevator is quite far, you know, then what else can we provide? Because certainly, you know, this may not affect just one person. So let's let's take everything into account when we're building our back of house or front of house. Amazing. Thank you. Um, OK, I'm going to switch gears a little bit because I do want to always address um, CFDA members that may not have a full show and maybe it's a presentation or maybe um, it's a smaller event. But let's think through the the notion of adaptive and or universal clothing and products, accessories, footwear, and being able to either show them with or without a talent. And is it something that has to be all or nothing? Meaning, could we have talent in a, a show, for example, or a presentation that the the designer doesn't have classic adaptive products and it's just I want to explain that a little bit further in case there's anybody that is not in the adaptive space right now adaptive clothing or accessories or product by definition is product that was developed to make dressing easier for people with disabilities those that struggle with dressing themselves or the elderly so that is the definition and and the the market that we are really developing uh helping to develop with brand partners in the adaptive space however there are absolutely products that exist currently that fall more into the bucket of universal which means that somebody with a disability could be able to wear that but they would need to be involved in the authenticity of that. So Paola, let's let's talk through that example because I definitely want this to be relatable for CFDA members that may not be in the adaptive space but could have products that you would be able to wear authentically in um, a presentation or a smaller show or even a, a bigger show. But that requires having you be involved in the decision of, of what is mm -hmm. authentic. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? For sure. So I've seen um, many comments within the community and in the industry that people are opting out to this universal fashion side of things because it's more fashionable, it's funner, um, it's a lot more authentic. You know, we've seen um, even brands like Tommy Hilfiger create adaptive labels. And when speaking to their design and sales team, because I really dig in deep to see what's going on within the brand, they, they told me that like about 30% of their consumers are non-disabled people. So definitely people are tapping into functional fashion because the consumer is shifting to more comfortable, functional, ready to wear every day to wear stuff. And I don't think the industry is realizing that it's adaptive in a way. And I think there's a huge cross that we would love to, um, you know, be able to further experiment. But I think as long as it's functional and it works for me and it works for somebody who's non-disabled, I think really that we'll be able to reach equity gaps. I really think that unifying non-disabled people and disabled people into one fashion category is really how we'll be able to reach equity in the industry because we can't keep preaching to the same choir. It's just not going to work. It's not a sustainable model. It's not going to get us anywhere. So I do think we're shifting over to functional fashion, which is simply working with Velcro, longer zipper strides, magnets, um, boots with zippers on the sides all the way to the ankle and on the side of the foot. And people don't even realize that this is adaptive fashion. And I think that's the most beautiful part about it. Absolutely. And, and that, as you said, that the bridging is something that is mm -hmm. so critically important in any fashion presentation, a runway, yeah. you know, a, a showroom, et cetera, is the understanding that 1.8 billion people on this planet identify mm -hmm. as having a disability making it the largest minority on the planet. the planet. So that is a tremendous amount of consumers that need to be included. And we have the power in the fashion industry 
to change that paradigm of what does a consumer look like? And how do we do that? Through our presentations, fashion shows, all of the fashion weeks, primarily New York Fashion Week. And we can do that by being inclusive, both with the talent and the production and having even from, as Jody spoke about um, earlier, is inviting people with disabilities to view. If, if our, the front of house is not accessible and we can't even have people with disabilities enter the venue to be able to participate in a presentation or a fashion show, that's a fail from that in, in, in for any type of presentation. So really, really thinking through that this actually is white space and understanding ways that we can include this huge population is critically important, especially in the fashion and beauty industries. So it's, it's actually hard to believe that we have almost come to the end of this presentation, but I'm always a very big believer in having our um, audience have a takeaway, something that if they can remember anything of this presentation, I want it to be this. So Paula, maybe you can start out with some lead behind, some call to action. I would definitely say engage more, you know, with your talent on the modeling side. You know, if you are booking a disabled model, if you know you need to really um, express diversity in the next campaign that you have, you need to go to experts first. Because what we've seen in the industry that creates tremendous amount of mishaps and mistakes is that everybody wants to include everybody, but in doing so, they oftentimes make a lot of mistakes and they do it wrong and then they get bashed by the community. When they could have simply gone to an expert like gamut management, runway of dreams, really, you know, grained in on the people who have these skill sets already, who know what the community wants and who could have potentially developed a, a successful campaign with a proper ROI percent. Um, I also think tapping into the talent is extremely important when you're past that um, focus group, that, that expert group that knows what you need and knows what you want. I think when you're selecting talent, it's more about how can I get this model to fully be herself and to fully express herself on set. It's not just, I want I want a model in a wheelchair, I want a model who that um, has a limb difference, or I want a model who has a mental cognitive disability. It's not about that. You know, we see modeling as a form of expression, as a form of art, and we expect those hiring us to view us as models as well, and not just as tokens that we can be checked off at, um, just done with. And then on the functional fashion part, on the universal fashion, it's where we're headed. So it's happened now. Beautiful. Thank you, Jody. Uh, the biggest takeaway I think from a production side is, as I mentioned, nothing is insurmountable. With a little bit of extra time and research and conversations with the people who know and who have the answers and not being afraid to ask the questions and make sure that you're including those voices anything is possible in event production. I mean, if you see some of the different um, runway shows that are out there, if you're bringing power to the middle of a park, you know, if you're um, hoisting somebody up into the air, all of that is just as possible as making sure an older building has ramps and accessibility and, and that the models are well cared for both front of house and back of house. Perfect, thank you. And my takeaway is actually going to be a, a quick story. Um, it's about uh, a teacher who happens to be in a wheelchair and he rolls up to school on a very snowy day and he sees the custodian shoveling the steps. And he says to him, would you mind please shoveling the ramp so that I can get into school? And the custodian says, absolutely, yes, let me finish the stairs and then that will be the absolute next thing I do. And the teacher said to the custodian, but if you do the ramp first, everyone can get into school. So please think about that, expand your consumer base, expand 
who can come see your presentations and your runway shows, who can be in them as well, who are your consumers. We can do this together. And that leads us, of course, to tremendous gratitude to the CFDA for having this important conversation because together we can really make change happen. And on behalf of Gamut Management, thank you so much for having this critically important conversation as we approach New York Fashion Week. And of course, a special thank you to Flamingo Interpreting and to Richard for doing such a beautiful job. Thank you so much. Sasha, over to you. And thank you. I'm Jody Impala. Your experiences, your stories, your knowledge um, is so valuable. Thank you for sharing that with our community. Richard, thank you so much for interpreting for us today. And Mindy, um, you know, I love that there's a resource, this incredible resource out in the world, and it's you. And we're not expecting every designer or brand or production or event person to be able to figure this out themselves. And we are hoping that this video, um, like Pally used the word bridge, bridges that gap of like being able to take that whether it's your first step or your second or your third to making your events, your fashion week shows more accessible. And there's going to be more information in the body of this uh, page where you can connect directly with Gamut Management to learn more, to take those steps. And we hope you do so. And please also know that CFDA is here to be a resource for you as well. And all of that contact information is below. And thank you to everyone today for joining us.